put it. Praise the Lord. Amen. It is now the uh, the Protestant Reformation. We're talking this evening about the Anabaptists. And first, I want to mention that the uh, if you're if you're watching live stream, you're probably expecting Susan with the uh, the Book of Romans, and there um, there if you, the best place to watch these videos if you're not watching them live is to go to our YouTube channel and if you go to the YouTube channel and look up Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church and look on the playlist there is a playlist for the Book of Romans course and I added a couple of videos there um, to cover the missed class um, she will continue in two weeks I believe with uh, with the Book of Romans, but there are a couple of additional videos at the YouTube channel for the Book of Romans course. And as as Val mentioned, next Sunday will or next Wednesday we'll have a guest speaker, and so this so we'll take a break from the course. But uh, I'm going to try to live stream the the guest speaker Peter Swart next week. But the actual courses will continue in two weeks, and we'll begin wrapping it up. And uh, we'll, we have, I guess, officially three sessions left. Um, session 10 and then session 11 will be mostly a review session, and then session 12 will be the test. Uh, but that, again, we're skipping one week, and that will continue in two weeks. So right now, let's talk about the Anabaptists. We've been going through the Protestant Reformation, and now we come to... Uh, the Anabaptists, and I'm primarily using the church in history pretty much as an outline as I as I go through here. So if you if you have the church in history book, it's chapter 25 that that most of my information has come from. And the Anabaptist is kind of a a a word that is used to apply to a lot of different groups. The word Anabaptist, of course, means to rebaptize, and that's one of their key characteristics is that the, they, they began to say that it's not good enough that you're baptized as an infant. You need to be baptized once you've made a decision for Christ. And it began with a man by the name of Conrad Grebel. Conrad Grebel was a prominent member of the church in Zurich. Now keep in mind, Zurich, that church was started by, or, or the Protestant Reformation in that city was was through Zwingli. So in 1521, Grebel joined a study group with Zwingli, and they studied the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, and uh, his life showed a dramatic change, and he became an earnest supporter of the preaching and the reforms of Zwingli. He rose to leadership among the Zwingli's young and enthusiastic followers, but it wasn't long before Grebel became keenly disappointed with both Zwingli and Luther. Now keep in mind, Zwingli and Luther and Calvin and most of these reformers that we've talked about so far still were baptizing infants and I guess didn't really put too much thought into it. Uh, but in 1525, George Blaurock asked Grebel to baptize him again which he did, and the, uh, I don't have this in, in your notes, but um, in just an additional comment on this, there was a public debate held on January 17th of 1525. Zwingli was arguing against Grebel, Blaurock, and a third man by the name of Manns, Felix Manns. These were three key guys that were, which were against infant baptism. But the city council decided in favor of Zwingli and in favor of infant baptism. Now, to, to us, with our Western mindset, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, what does the city council have to do with this? 
you know, but back then it was, you know, the, the, the church state union was pretty solid and, and, um, you know, the city council or the governing authorities had a major say in what you could do and what you couldn't do, even in the church. And that's why Luther and Zwingli both presented their beliefs to the Diet of Augsburg. And so this, this debate took place in a public forum with the city council, but they decided in favor of Zwingli and in favor of infant baptism, and they ordered Greville and his group to cease their activities, and he ordered that any, this is the city council giving this order, that any unbaptized infants, infants must be submitted for baptism within eight days. Can you imagine a government organization saying something like that? <laughs> Um, and, and with our Western mindset, we think, well, what, what is it, uh, their business? <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's why, uh, you know, people came to America in the first place to escape all, all that religious bondage that was uh, in Europe and, and the government's controlling um, what you could believe and what you couldn't believe. But anyway, so th the babies were, the infants were ordered to be baptized within eight days and fail failure to comply with the council's order would result in exile from the canton. Now the word canton is the state, what we would call a state. They, they refer to it as a canton in Switzerland. Grebel had an <coughs> infant daughter, Isabella, who, who had not been baptized, and uh, he resolutely stood his ground. He did, he did not intend for her to be baptized. So the group, Th these, you know, Greville, Mans, and Balrock and their little Bible study group uh, met on the 21st of January, just a few days after that city council meeting, and they all baptized each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Greville baptized um, Blaurock, and then Blaurock baptized a bunch of the others. So um, they, they stood their ground. As a group, they pledged to hold hold to the faith of the New Testament and live their lives, um, li live as fellow disciples separated from the world. And they left their, their little gathering full of zeal and encouraged. And so that, that, that basically was the beginning of the Anabaptist movement. So... Um, the uh, the practice of rebaptizing certainly was th th that really shows you the two key issues if you, if there were any two important issues that set the Anabaptists apart it was the rebaptizing you know so if you were baptized as a baby you know once you place your faith in Christ whether you were baptized before or not once you place your faith in Christ and that's based upon a scripture in the book of Acts chapter 8 where um, the Ethiopian asked Philip well here's water what hinders me from being water baptized and Philip responded if you believe that Jesus is the Christ thou mayest be baptized so so um, we believe and the Anabaptists believe that that it needs to be based upon your own confession your own confession of faith and so this was this was one issue. The other, the other issue was the church st state thing that they didn't believe that the church and the state are synonymous. In other words, uh, the church should be made up of true born again Christians or true followers of Christ, not um, that that everything's automatically through the state. So, but because of the rebaptism, the group became known as the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptist movement spread almost instantaneously to many countries throughout Europe. And they also were known as the Company of the Committed. They were committed to New Testament teaching to the best that they understood it. Um, they were not interested in creeds. They were not interested in organizations. They were not interested in rituals or anything that, that added to... What, what's clearly taught in scripture. They were devoted to Bible study. They believed that the reformers were not purifying the church fast enough. So 
the Anabaptist movement was in part a reaction to the church-state bond. Uh, the, um, we, we've talked in the past about the origin of the close ties of the church and state. Most citizens of the state felt that they were members of the church since the mass conversion of the times of Constantine and Clovis. In other words, way back when we talked about Constantine, and Constantine became a Christian, well, if you're part of the empire, it's, you know, most likely you're going to call yourself a Christian. Um, and then Clovis, when he became a Christian, remember he was baptized, and I think it was like 3,000 of his soldiers got baptized with him. You know, it, it, it was almost an automatic thing. If, you, if the leader, the emperor, the king, the city council, or whatever, if the government turns to a certain religion, you're almost considered automatically part of that religion. Um, in, in those times. But the Anabaptist was opposed to that way of thinking. And, you know, there's a lot of good things to say about the Anabaptists. We're going to see some things that where some of them got off track, but, but uh, they, they, they had a sincere heart to go to the purity of Scripture. Um, so, but the, the type of membership that the churches were practicing up to this point not just the Catholic, but also the Protestant, um, brought uh, this type of membership brought much of the world into the church. So councils or princes joining the Reformation movement brought cities and states into Protestantism. The external aspects of rituals and church order can easily be changed, but the personal lives of many had not been touched in a real fashion. So, so they're saying that it's easy to change from this ritual to that ritual or to end this practice and start that practice. But what's really important is our lives being changed, our, our hearts being transformed. So um, many use the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith as an excuse for loose living and in his last year, Martin Luther lamented over the low morality of the great mass of those who called themselves Lutherans. But the Anabaptists insisted that membership in the church shouldn't be automatic and it shouldn't be too easy. <laughs> um, you know, church membership is, is to be limited to those who consciously committed themselves to Christ. And they objected to easy membership by way of the state declaring it so in mass or by ordinance. Uh, so separation between church, separation of church and state was very important to the Anabaptists. They stood for liberty and for a free church, free from the government's dictates. <coughs> uh, they opposed the establishment of any doctrine, church, or religion by law. Okay, the, the church heresy shouldn't be considered a crime punish, punishable by city or national government. Anabap Anabaptists promoted a separation from the world mindset. They believed that Christians should not hold government office nor be a soldier. They believed that Christians shouldn't take an oath nor sue in the courts. Um, and the the Anabaptist ideal of what a church would look like would be to go back completely to the faith and practices of the apostles in the early church. They had high regard for Christ, his word, his church, and of course love, holiness, and, and also self-denial. They took the Great Commission very seriously and had a passionate missionary concern. Okay, so when we talk about the Great Commission, of course we're talking about that last sermon, that last speech that Jesus gave to go into all the world so they and, and promote the gospel and make disciples. So they felt it was very important to teach people and train people, disciple people, uh, into what it means to be a, a follower of Christ. So, uh, and, and that means not, not just living as you wish through the week and just going to church on Sunday or just calling yourself a Protestant just because you're in a Protestant state or Catholic because you're in a Catholic state. The, they, so they believe they should be free from the state 
composed of only true believers and no infant baptism. The Anabaptists also had what they called the community of goods. Now this is um, um, basically the idea that we see in, in chapter 4 of Acts where they had all things in common. That they, what, what's yours is mine, what's mine is yours. We, uh, we, you know, we, we share what God has blessed us with, Amen. Um, is, is the idea here. But some, some of them took it to an extreme, which we'll see in a minute, um, w which is true with almost everything, it seems like. There's always people that are going to take things to an extreme. With amazing rapidity, groups of Anabaptists sprang up in many of the cantons in Switzerland, and also it grew into the areas of Austria, Bohemia, southern Germany, and down the Rhine Valley to the Netherlands. In Switzerland, they were known as the Swiss Brethren. And what we begin to see that as they grow and spread out into different parts of, of Europe, they become known primarily by different names in different sections. They were, in, they were the Swiss Brethren in the Switzerland. They were the Mennonites in the Netherlands. And... Um, in... In, uh, and there's also a group that was known as the Hutterites, <laughs> by the way. Um, in, in 1533, a Swiss Brethren minister by the name of Jacob Hutter became the pastor of the Anabaptists in Moravia. And he, inspired by the Book of Acts, Hutter introduced a strict discipline of communal living. So this kind of borders on communism at this point. <laughs> Uh, each community is called a a Bruderhof, uh, which I guess means brother estate, um, going by what I was reading in the textbook, and nobody could own anything. Today, there are over 100 Bruderhofs in Alberta and Manitoba, and several actually even in the United States. Um, so, and so it's basically everything belongs to everybody. <laughs> everything in the community belongs to the, the Bruderhof. So you, you, you're not allowed to own anything of yourself. Whatever you have, it belongs to all of us. And uh, so no personal ownership, which, you know, taking things to an extreme. Um, but there was heavy persecution against these guys, but also heavy persecution against many of the Anabaptists broke out. Um, and Hutter was burned at the stake in 1536. So, but the Anabaptists do get heavily persecuted, and it's really a shame that even the Protestants started joining in with this persecution. Uh, because of their doctrinal, political, and social views, the Anabaptists were extremely, or considered extremely obnoxious <laughs> to both the Catholics and the Lutherans. Um, refusal to baptize infants or rebaptizing adults was unheard of. And in high degree, um, re reprehensible. Refusing to cooperate with the church state and their socialistic tendencies made them suspect. They were generally regarded as a revolutionary sect and dangerous to society. So this, this is the attitude of the 16th century. Now, I think most people, most Christians today, when we think of the Anabaptists, we don't have these kind of thoughts. But back then, they were rejected by both Catholics and Protestants. They were persecuted by both Catholics and Protestants. The book tells us that there was relentless persecution of the Anabaptists that broke out from both Catholics and Protestants. The Anabaptists were imprisoned. They were fined. They were drowned. They were burned. They were tortured. They were persecuted in all manners for such crimes as, get this, refusal to pay your taxes, <laughs> or, or your tithes, I mean. Mm -hmm. Refusal to pay your tithes, punishable, punishable by law. Mm. <laughs> Not attending church, refraining from Bible study groups. Mm. All these, of course, were, were crimes against the state. With that state, church-state union, um, there were crimes not just against the church, but against <laughs> the state in those days, and thousands were put to death. So one solution Michael Hoffman came up with was he, he um, started the Anabaptist Kingdom of Munster. Um, basically trying to break away from all the persecution, he formed his own little 
um, state, you could say, um, or tried to. Michael Hoffman, uh, a, a furrier by trade, at first an enthusiastic follower of Luther, but then he joined the Anabaptists, and he worked out he worked out a weird interpretation of Scripture, by which he confounded the unlearned, and he was opposed not only to the state churches, or he not only opposed by the state churches, but also by the Swiss Anabaptists. So he, he's so extreme that even the Anabaptists didn't like him. <laughs> and, and here's where he was really getting into ex extremes. He's one of these guys that predict, predicted that Christ would return. He believed that Christ would return, or he said Christ would return in 1533. And whatever he was doing, whatever he was saying, multitudes fled to Munster. Multitudes in the Nez Netherlands followed. Um, and he was, he was imprisoned. In Strasbourg and died there but one thing when in his prediction of Christ returning in 1533 he also said that there would be he said that Enoch was going to come not Elijah but Enoch was going to come before Christ returns so um, one of the followers of Hoffman was Jan Mathis a baker from I guess that's pronounced Harlem. Um, he declared himself Prophet Enoch, whom Hoffman said would come before Christ returned. And so Mathis, in 1533, uh, his followers made themselves masters of Munster, and Mathis took charge of, of Munster. He proclaimed Munster was going to be the New Jerusalem, with the community of goods and without law. And from Germany and from the Netherlands, thousands streamed into the city. Wow. So a lot of, you know, a lot of people were, were buying what they were selling. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, in spite of all the extreme stuff, they, they were teaching a lot of good things, but, you know, they were adding some of this nonsense to it and uh, made themselves a, a bad reputation also. Uh, one of the most, this point C here, one of the most tragic episodes in the entire history of the Christian church. It got pretty bloody. Uh, Munster was besieged by an army of Catholics and Lutherans. Well, the, uh, the Anabaptists stood their ground for a long time, and they, uh, they, after granting a short period of grace to leave the city, uh, the Anabaptists killed without mercy all those suspected of being out of sympathy with them. And according to the textbook, the suffering was indescribable. So it, they're, they're all killing each other. You know, it's, it's the, the Catholics and the Protestants against the Anabaptists, but the Anabaptists are also slaughtering as much as they could in return. Um, apparently, that's, that's the way it reads in, in the textbook. Um, Mathis himself was killed in battle. In April of 1534, and the next guy to take charge was a guy by the name of John of Leyden. John of Leyden took charge. Now Leyden introduced the practice of polygamy, so you can see they're they're taking all kinds of strange doctrines on now. Um, Leyden introduced the practice of polygamy. So this this is not let's to be clear this is not a mainstream Anabaptist group, and even the mainstream Anabaptist groups rejected what was going on at Munster. So um, he introduced the practice of, of polygamy, and in autumn of 1534, he assumed the title of king. For more than a year under, under Leyden, uh, these Anabaptists defended themselves with fanatical courage, uh, but on June 24, 1535, the city was taken, um, terrible massacre follow, followed, and leaders were horribly tortured. Anyway, the textbook calls that one of the most tragic episodes of the entire history of the Christian church, and certainly, I would say, especially from a Protestant perspective, that just never should have happened. <laughs> that, never, um, that never should have taken place. 
Mm -hmm. and and to think that people who call themselves followers of Christ would would take on that kind of uh, fighting against each other. Um, well, let's talk about the Mennonites. They're a, m a more peaceful, <laughs> yes. a more peaceful group of Anabaptists. Um, this was a man by the name of Menno Simmons, or Simons, I'm sorry, Menno Simons, a Dutch reformer. He was actually first ordained as a Catholic priest in 1524 in his own province of Friesland, I guess is, is how you say that. And in, um, in his first year as a priest, he began to doubt the doctrine of transubstantiation, which I believe we talked about briefly uh, a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. or so. And various events caused him to search the scriptures, the ancient writings, the, the writings of Luther. He began to, to read a lot of material that began to transform his way of thinking. But he, eventually he left the priesthood, but it wasn't until 1536. Um, in 1536, he left the Roman appointment that, that he had and united with the Anabaptists. He traveled widely throughout the Netherlands and neighboring parts of Germany, proclaiming his own version of Anabaptism. Um, and he organized his followers into churches, and they, of course, became known as the Mennonites. He, he organized his followers into churches, teaching and exhorting them by preaching and writing. And excess and fanaticism of few radical Anabaptists discredited the movement for a long time. For, for much of the 16th century, and this is still the 16th century that we're talking about here, for, for much of the 16th century, the, uh, the Anabaptists had a negative image because of the few fanatics, the few radicals that were doing all kinds of extreme things. And I wanted to read something on page 209. Actually, there's something else I wanted to read before then. Okay, so Sim let me talk just a little bit more about Simmons. Menno Simmons. He, he led a moderate group of Anabaptists which flourished during the second half of the 16th century. And in time, his followers became known as the Mennonites instead of as Anabaptists, and they were peaceful, industrious, prosperous, and highly respected citizens. And I believe even even today, um, when you hear of Mennonites, mm -hmm. you think of peaceful, friendly people that um, family oriented, and and I don't think anybody has anything really negative to say about Mennonites. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, while, while the Anabaptists were almost universally rejected during the Reformation days today, they are honored as having been pious Christians whose major contribu contribution to the doctrine of believers of the Believer's Church, their major contribution was the doctrine of a Believer's Church, which included the separation of church and state. And then finally, the Amish. The Amish, just like the Mennonites, the Amish are, for the most part, very well respected. And the Amish didn't really come around until about 150 years later, uh, the end of the 17th century. In, in 1693, a division occurred in the congregations of the Swiss Brethren. A man by the name of Jacob Amon felt that the shunning of the excommunicated members was a biblical command. Others felt that this applied primarily to the Lord's Supper. Following the rupture or the split, the followers of Amun set up a rigorous church discipline which has caused them to maintain a unique tradition, a unique traditional way of life. Settlements of Amish can be found today in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, Illinois, and Ontario. 
it doesn't mention Illinois, but I'm from Illinois, and I know there are <laughs> there are groups of Amish in Illinois. Um, so, wow, I went through that way too quickly. But I went through all that I had on the Anabaptist, and I went through it too quickly. Anybody have any questions or thoughts or? Just that I need to make lo make more notes. <laughs> I didn't realize that the Mennonites came out of that, or the Amish. Yeah. Out of the Anabaptists. Yeah, the Anabaptists is divided up into a lot of you know they're 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 di divisions of a division, <laughs> you could say. Just like um, when when you say Baptist, there's mm. Southern Baptist, General Baptist, mm. um, American Baptist. There's a lot of different kinds of Baptists, Baptist. and there's a lot of different kinds of Anabaptists, and even Quakers uh, and Friends, they they kind of break off from the Anabaptists also, uh -huh. which we'll get to those in uh, I don't know if it's the next chapter or yeah. or soon. Mm -hmm. um, but all right, well, it's a short session, but um, next week we will have Peter Swart, and the week after that we'll continue uh, to talk about um, some some more of the Protestant Reformation, primarily the 16th century and the 17th century, some of the Reformation groups that were taking place at that point, and uh, then we'll the week after that we'll review, and the week after that we'll have the test. So God bless you, and thank you for joining, and we'll see you next week. Amen. But the Mennonites, they didn't believe in um, more than one God, did they? No, no, no they weren't. They weren't. They, Mennonites are still. Um, there's a lot of Mennonites in Illinois, also. I've I've known Mennonites uh, when I lived in Illinois, mm -hmm. but no, they're not polygamists. It was just that one group, the in Munster, that uh, started teaching that. <coughs>